Thank you, Corey, and praise team. I think you guys might have prayed up this week or something. Uh, appreciate it. And it uh, makes it a whole lot easier for me to preach. Because some of you pro- hopefully woke up during that, didn't you? Uh, hey, I, w- I wanted to do, she's not here right now, but she was in Sunday school. Miss Neva Joseph turned 90 this last week. All right? Praise God. She's the, we have two that are here every Sunday in worship on uh, that are over 90, and I praise God for that. Still coming to church, don't make excuses. I thank God for that. And Miss Neve is here almost every Sunday morning for Sunday school. And, and Pam, would you let her know that we have mentioned it? She's in your Sunday school class. And, and uh, matter of fact, let's sing happy birthday to her, even though she's not here. She'll find out about it, okay? Happy birthday, Miss Neva, all right? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Miss Neva. Happy birthday to you. All right. I tell you what, people that some of, you, some of us find excuses not to come to church. When you're 90 and you don't make excuses all the time, praise God. All right. I'm, I'm hoping she. She mentioned to me during Sunday school when I went back and talked to her, she mentioned that she had to take her to a restaurant she likes to go to in Louisville because it was her 90th birthday. I told her, man, when you're 90, you can ask for anything you want. And she goes, yeah, I'm old enough to say anything I want. And I, I said, yes, ma'am. You know, and, and that's the way it works. The rest of you, Brother Norm back there, don't even start. You already do. So you can say anything you want. All right? Miss Mary, she's too sweet. She do not say much about people. All right. I didn't even get a chance to shake hands with Miss Mary today. I was getting this side when she came in. But I praise God for senior adults that are still in God's house, praising the Lord and worshiping God. All right. Amen. That means all you youngsters from 70 to 90 or you know, but still, we appreciate you too. Uh Today we're going to be talking about something, and, I, and, and believe me, it gets to be, boy, everybody has their opinion, and opinion are, about, are kind of like bad parts of the body we don't want to talk about. And, uh, but how about it? Are you prejudiced? Now, I'm going to bring a bunch of di- different types of prejudice up today, or at least a few we're going to talk about today, but God's Word is pretty clear about it. You know, when we talk about prejudice, we, we like to talk about skin color and, and different cultures. That is one, and I want to just say right now, there's no place for that being prejudiced anywhere with God's people. And one thing I can say is that in the last church I pastored in Hawaii, that, that we had seven different ethnic groups and several from different ethnic groups. I praise God for every one of them. Some of them have differences in the way they think about stuff, but it's kind of like going through some of the marriage courses we go through. It doesn't mean you're wrong, you're just different. But let me tell you something. You country folks are different than city folks. All right? We're all different. There's nothing wrong with being different. There is something wrong when we get our differences in somebody else's face. And there's no place in the kingdom of God for prejudice of any kind. We're going to talk about some of those in God's Word today. So we're going to be in the book of James. Um, I think we're in chapter 2, and that says chapter 3, and I hope chapter 2 is up there. So we're going to find out in just a second. If not, William, have fun. <laughs> All right. Because my clicker ain't getting us forward, so I'm thinking maybe you're having fun. I need the second chapter of James, if you would, real quick. If that's not, that'll be good for next week, though. Because it's not about prejudice. Next week, you all come because it's about gossip in your tongues. I know about half of you lay out next week. We'll know that which ones you are, okay? I just said that, so maybe you'll come next week. Um, so you try to prove everybody that's not you that we're talking about. And so... Uh, Ah, looky there. Chapter 2, verse 1. I just have to look up going, wait a second, I'm going to be on the wrong page at the wrong time. James says, Dear brothers and sisters, 
How can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? Now, he is not going to talk about race here. He's going to talk about really social and economic type things. He's, talking, he's going to talk about people that have and the have nots. I've pastored a lot of churches that were have not churches. Let, in the Kiski, Alaska, and we had two people on staff that were there. Um, in the Kiski, Alaska, I want to tell you, it was one of the poorest, it was the poorest church I've ever pastored. But it was the richest church as far as people being willing to work for the Lord. Because they didn't have any money to throw, throw at it, they had to give of themselves. And I want to tell you, people that give of themselves, praise God what can be done. That church grew to be over five, well, more than like six times the size it was when we got there. Built over 20-some thousand square feet of building. Did At one time, had way over a hundred different ministries outside of the church. You know why? Not because of money, because God can take care of that. Because of people that were willing to do whatever God asked them to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you one. Some of you heard me talk about this before, but in just a minute, uh, we're on the second verse now. It says, for example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. It's been about over two and a half years ago. I haven't been here but about six months, maybe. And I don't even remember who it was, so you don't have to worry about me talking to you. I'm just talking about you right now, okay? Because I really don't, I, this is honest, I do not remember who it was. But I have it's a couple of you. There was a lady that came in that was homeless, and she was laying right on that bench over there by where Ashley's at. And I had several people come to me and say, what are you going to do about that, Pastor? And I said, nothing. Matter of fact, it kind of offended me. I think you all know better than to come and ask me something like that now. But the truth of the matter is, anybody has a right to come in and worship God in this place, no matter what they look like, what they smell like, no matter where they've been, no matter if they got out of the gutter, because where else should they be instead of the house of God? I love it because Paul opens this up just so perfectly to talk about it, doesn't he? Verse 3, it says, if you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor. Hmm. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? This is God's word, folks. I'll be, very, I'll be very honest. I don't care what you think about it. It's God's word. I know what I think about it. It's his word. It's holy. It's right. And that's the way it is. You see, we don't get to argue about or discuss what God's word means when it's clear what it means. Well, do we really want them people in our church? Oh, I used to hear that. My goodness. In Alaska when I first got there, do we really want those kind of people in our church? Let me tell you something. You better go back and look at the New Testament. Jesus loved them kind of people. Do you really want to be a poor? I had other pastors tell me all the time, do you really want to be a poor church? You need to go after the people that got money. Man, I couldn't even find anybody that had money in Nikiski, Alaska. You, you know, you need to go after the ones that have money. You need to go after the ones that, that got everything. You need to go after the ones that can do something for you. Folks, I want to tell you, I'm not looking for people to do something for me. I'm looking for people to fall out in love with Jesus Christ to do everything for him. You see, that's what it's all about. It doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter what they smell like. It doesn't matter how much they have or how much they don't have. If they have the love for God in their heart, praise God, we ought to join in. He goes on and verse 5 says, Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith? It's true, let me tell you. 
I'll give you this too. The people that have the least amount give more percentage-wise to God. There's all kinds of statistics showing that. See, people got a lot of money try to cheat God to try to figure out how they don't have to give as much to God. People that are poor know they got to give to God or they're never going to make it. All right? I know I got to give to God because I'm never going to make it if I don't give to God. Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? He goes on to say, but you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who will press you and drag you into court? <laughs> yeah, them poor ones can't afford a lawyer. Let's just be honest. The rich ones can afford lawyers. So they like to sue. They like to get richer. But I want to tell you, he's not only talking about money here, he's talking about everything. He's just using money as an example. Aren't they, the one, aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? Yes, indeed. It is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scriptures, love your neighbor as yourself. I know some of you right now think, I don't like my neighbors that much. You got a problem with God. You don't have a problem with your neighbor. Very simple. You got a problem with God. Because God's word says you're going to love your neighbors. Well, I didn't get to pick my neighbors. Right. You got a problem with God. How about the church? I don't like everybody in the church. Guess what? God does. How about other Christians? Well, I don't like all Christians. Some Christians don't act like Christians. Well, neither do you. Quit being so holier than thou. I'm sorry for you visitors. I'm this way all the time. It's just not because you're here. I just, I just want to let you know. Just in case. Just in case. I just want to let you know. But if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You get this? Woo! Lordy, lordy. <laughs> That's an old saying from my growing up. Lordy, lordy. You are guilty of breaking the law. It's a sin. Let me tell you one of the examples in my life, and it wasn't that many years ago. In the church, last church I pastored in Hawaii, Terry Bradshaw was a member of our church. He joined after I got there. Became a very good friend of mine. Been at his house. Been at his house over here in the mainland. Been at his house in Hawaii. Uh, once you're not his pastor, you're not as good a friend as you used to be. But still, became a very good friend of mine. And I have to admit, you know, I, I grew up watching Terry Bradshaw play football like nobody else. And when his wife walked into our church one Sunday and introduced herself to me and said, Terry will be here next week, I thought, right. Terry came the next week, and man, Terry's just like he is on TV, man. He won't leave you alone. He, I mean, he and I picked on each other constantly. We would, we would pick on each other all the time. He would, every time he'd get around Deb, my wife, he'd kiss her all over from her forehead, all the way down her cheeks, all the way around. I mean, he didn't miss a spot. You know, he'd, just, he'd grab a hold of me and hug me, and he'd hit me in the chest about knock me out, make me breathe hard and everything, and that's just who he is. He's an old football player. He didn't know any better. He's a country boy. But there was times, if I didn't watch myself, I would find myself, Speaking to him. Because he loved preaching. And he even preached for me a couple of times. If he'd ever get off his high horse, I'd have him here to give his testimony someday. But somebody get a hold of him and tell him that. I can call him. I got his number. But still, I call his wife, though, if I want to talk to him. Just like most of you. Um, and so, uh, but I, I fell into this trap. And I realized. See, God's word says, but if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You don't get to do that. I don't either. We got to love all God's children. All right, we got to love them all. You don't have to like everything you do. I don't like a lot of things my kids do, but I love them. I don't like a lot of things my grown grandkids do, but I love them. I'll chew them out when I get a chance, but I love them. 
Verse 10 says, For the person who keeps all the laws except one is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. He says a sin is a sin and a sinner is a sinner. Okay, you broke one, you sinned. He's trying to explain this so they understand. Don't, don't think, well, nine out of ten is not bad. It's not good, folks. This is not horseshoes. You don't get points for being close. Verse 11 says, For the same God who said, You must not commit adultery, also said, You must not murder. So if you murder someone, but do not commit adultery, you have still broken the law. So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. It's not about what people think. It's not about what I think. Let me tell you this. It's not even about what your parents and grandparents think. Some of the reason our thinking is messed up is because how we were raised. I'll just be very honest. What you and I need to start doing is taking the precious word of God, opening it up, and see what God's word says. It's as simple as that. You find it in God's word. You say, well, I don't know where to find it, Pastor. Well, go to Google. They can Google it, I guarantee you. What does the Bible say about? I'll just give you a good start. And then you just put it in there, and you watch what happens. I love Googling it. Saves me so much time anymore. Those old strong concordance and all those things used to drive me nuts. But God's word says, whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. And then he goes on to say, there will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. Is that a tough one? I know in some people's mind they think, and I've heard people talk like this, oh, I'm very merciful. If you ask them what they've done that's merciful, they couldn't give you a very long list. You know why? Because they're really not. But if you've been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. I don't know about you. I want to stand that line and be able to say, Lord, Forgive me. I know I haven't been merciful enough, but Lord, I'm trying. You see, we sang about the veil. Let me tell you something. When you and I go before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that veil that was ripped from the top to the bottom in the temple when Jesus was on the cross made it that you and I can enter the Holy of Holies and you and I stand before a holy God. And you won't be able to blame anything on anybody else, folks. You won't be able to blame it on your parents, on your neighbors, on your sisters, on your brothers, on your church people, on the deacons, on the pastor. You will have to stand before God and God alone. There's all kinds of prejudice. There's prejudice in churches because we've always done it that way before. And we have a mindset on not changing anything for heaven's sakes. Let me tell you something. Everything in this building is about 35 years old. Guess what? I'd change it if we had a little more of this. You say, oh no, Pastor, it's so beautiful. Well, then fill it up. I could live with it if we had it filled. Wouldn't care a bit. But guess what? In the years it's been built, it's never been filled. When it was being built, it was about two-thirds full. And within a couple years after that time, it was about half that much. Just a few years after that time. See, it's not about the building. It's not about the people in the building. It's about loving God more than anything else and then loving our neighbors as ourselves. That's what God's Word is talking here. But not being prejudiced in any way, in anything, against anybody for anything. Well, they just don't act the way I think they should. Well, did God ask you about it? When did the Holy Spirit come to you and say, would you tell me what you think about so-and-so? I'd be willing to bet it's never happened. So keep it to yourself. 
you guys ready to go on? Cause we, we're kind of switching gears here. I'm, I know so many are just begging to. So, all right. Verse 14. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith? Now he's going from loving one another and prejudice to having faith to showing that you really love God more than anything else. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Hmm. Let me just try to even make this a little clearer. I don't care if you know this Bible inside and out and you've been in church since the day you were born. I don't care if you can quote half of it to other people. If you cannot live a life for Jesus Christ in this world that other people may be saved, your faith stinks. You don't have any. But you can tell people how much you know and how godly you are. But if you're not leading people to Jesus, there's not much results in the line of results in your life oh i've got faith pastor i just can't tell you how much how much faith i got i know you can't tell me i'll leave it there verse 15 suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say goodbye and have a good day stay warm and eat well but then you don't give the person any food or clothing. What good does that do? <laughs> oh, I'm going to pray for you. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds. Which good deeds only come from God. It is dead and, you hear this word? Listen to this one. Useless has no use to God or anybody else. Verse 18 says, Now someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. <laughs> well, i got a lot of faith. I don't do anything about it. I just sit around and look, but i got a lot of faith. I just talked about that a little bit. But others... Have good deeds. But I say, listen what James is saying. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? The two go hand in hand. They're like this. They're like a married couple that are married and have the paperwork. You become one in the sight of God. And if you're loving with each, living with each other, you're living in sin and you need to get married. But... This is being married and becoming one as a couple before God. And that's what he's saying about this faith and good deeds. They become one. And if not, they're just playing the game is all it is. I will show you my faith by my good deeds. He's not saying, watch, I'm getting ready to. He's not telling them, keep an eye, I'm getting ready to. He said, all you got to do is follow me around a little while and you'll see that I got faith because of what I'm doing. You'll see I got faith because of what God's doing through me. You'll see I got faith because I love God and I love God's people and I do whatever God asks me to. We go on to verse 19. It says, you say you have faith for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble in fear. I want to tell you, Satan and his demons know more about God's Word than all of us put together. They know more about what it says than all of us put together. But they all will spend eternity in hell. Oh, you see, Pastor, do you believe that's true? Yeah, that's what God's Word says. I, I know it's true. Oh, just because you know something doesn't mean you know someone. And just because you know someone doesn't mean you've given your 100% of yourself to that someone, Jesus Christ. God's Word says even the demons tremble. Satan himself trembles. But they're not children of God. 
You and I know Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, children of God, and we need to quit playing games with the Word of God and apply it to our hearts and do His will in our life. Verse 20 says, how foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? He uses this word again, useless. I don't know about you, but if somebody tells me I'm useless, I'm probably going to be offended. If somebody tells their kid they're useless, shame on you. Because they're going to turn out that way. How foolish are we though? That we don't understand that if we have faith, we will do what God leads us to do and tells us to do. If we have faith in God, we will do everything we can to honor Him and glorify Him. If we have faith in God, other people will see what's going on in our lives and because that will want what we got. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be useless. Spiritually useless. I don't care what you've done in this world. I don't care how much of the ladder of success you've climbed. I don't care how much money you make. I want to know what your relationship with Jesus Christ is and what you're doing for him. That's where it's at. With as little as you have or as much as you have. That's where it's at. Verse 21 says, Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Now we could go to Hebrews 11 and read many of the examples of faith in God's word. This is one of them. We'll see another one in a second. But don't you remember that? You see, Abraham didn't sit around praying, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And then lied to God. You know, I've, I've been around a whole lot of preachers in my life. I've been around a whole lot of them and, and, a, and a whole lot of their wives. And, and I hear them stories all the time. Well, I wasn't going to leave the area I'm in. No, no. I'm called by God to do anything God called me to do. But I can't leave my family. I don't understand it. My wife gets offended because people say, I'd never be able to leave my grandkids. She said, we've never been able to be around our grandkids. Because if you're going to do what God does, you do, wants you to do, you do what God wants you to do. See, Abraham went sitting around saying, you know, Lord, I'll do anything you want me to do. God just says, all right, Abraham, here's a good one for you. I want you to take your son Isaac and sacrifice him on the mountain. I want you to kill him on the mountain. Oh, Listen. I know some of you right now, well, God doesn't ask anybody to kill anybody. He asked Abraham. He's not going to ask you. You never had enough faith to even come close to that. Don't worry about it. It's not going to hit you. All right? Don't worry about it. You're not going to become Job either because you've never been as close to God as Job is. He is not going to take everything you got so he can give it all back so he can show the world. He's already done that. All right? So quit using those as excuses. All right? So he tells Abraham, Abraham, I want you to take your son Isaac. Isaac, big enough that he can carry the wood and everything else. He's probably a young man. I preached on this a few months back. He gets up there. He's ready to take his son's life. Why? Because he had faith in God. That God, even if he took it, would bring him back alive. Even if he burned him on the altar right there, God could bring him back alive. He had faith in God. See, the problem with you and I, we don't hardly walk out our door with enough faith in God to live the day. And as you know, God provided a ram. You see, this example could have never been used in God's word if he wouldn't have been faithful enough to follow what God had told him to do. You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. So without actions, your faith cannot be complete. Sitting around talking about it, sitting around telling somebody else they ought to do it, sitting around praying about it all the time and never doing nothing about it is a sin before Almighty God. Verse 23 says, And so it happened that as the Scripture says, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. 
Don't you want to be counted as righteous? I do. I fail all the time, but I ask God to forgive me so I can be counted as righteous before him. He was even called, and I want to be called this, the friend of God. We sing that song sometimes. I am a friend of God. We sing it doesn't mean we are. But I want to tell you we should be. We go on in verse 24 it says, So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. We need to be doers of the word. We need to have enough faith to do whatever God's word tells us to do, no matter what anybody else thinks. We need to live a faithful life to God so people will come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. We have revival coming April the 5th. I talked to Charles Roselle. I've known him for 20-some years or more now. He's 80-some years old. He could outrun me. He's too small to whip me, I think. I'm not sure anymore. But that man in his ministry has baptized over 9,000 people. He's going to tell us how to lead people to Jesus with five simple statements that most of us have never used before. But he's the kind of man that his actions speak louder than even his words. And he's mighty wordy. He's a preacher. All right? Verse 25, Rahab the prostitute is another example. Aren't you glad of that? You got Abraham, Father Abraham, that's a religious one. And now you got the prostitute. That kind of hits home a little bit more. I'm not calling everybody here prostitutes, don't get me wrong. But I mean, that type of sin kind of hits a little bit more, doesn't it? Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions, by what she did, when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. Isn't that cool? Just as a body is dead without breath, listen to this verse. Just as a without breath. When you quit breathing, it's not too long, everything else quits working. And if that breath does not come back, you and I go from this world to either heaven or hell, depending on if we know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior or not. So also faith, listen to this, is dead without good works. That's the things of God. I'm going to ask you today, how's our faith? Oh, I got a lot of faith. Not if you don't have good works. You got a lot of talk about stuff. You got a lot of braggart in you. You got a lot of arrogancy in you. You got a lot of things that aren't right with God, but you don't have anything right with God until our faith becomes what we do with and in our lives. How about it? So we look at this passage of Scripture. Boy, I want to tell you, for one thing, God starts off and he says, listen, you, don't, you can't, you can't look at anybody better than anybody else. Who are you and who am I to look at somebody better or worse than we are? It's all but by the grace of God that all of us aren't in the same boat as some people are. You say, oh, no, I was never been that stupid. No, you probably are. You've just been lucky. It don't matter. God's word still says you don't, get a, you don't have a right to treat anybody treat anybody different than somebody else. And then he says right after that, you say you got faith, prove it by what you do. Oh, you say, I go to church. That isn't faith. Heathens go to church. You say, oh, I'm active in church. So what? You say, Pastor, you're trying to get everybody to stay home? No, I'm talking about the tongue next week. I want you all to come. You say, Pastor, are you trying to say that even though I come to church and was raised in church and even though I read my Bible and I know my Bible and even though I, 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 I do all those things that I may not be right with God? No, God's Word said that. 
Because if you have faith, you will do good deeds. In other words, you will do God's work. If you don't, you won't. Quit lying to yourself and give it over to God and say, God, help me to be obedient, to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. See, that's what it's all about. We're going to have a time of invitation in just a moment. Corey's going to come. But I'm going to ask you, first of all, today, do you know my Jesus as personal Lord and Savior? He died on the cross of Mount Calvary that you might be saved. All you have to do is come and ask him into your heart. I'd love to pray with you. That you can invite Christ into your heart. He'll forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He'll take away the guilt. He'll take away the sin. And you'll be with him in heaven when you pass from this old world. Second thing I want to ask you. Very simple. How's your faith today? How about you? Do you make a list of things you do or can you make a thing... A list of things that only God could do. That's the difference. Only God could do. If that list isn't very long, I'd beg you to come and say, God, help me, Lord, to be obedient to you and do whatever you ask me to do. Maybe you just need to come and rededicate that life. Maybe you need to pray for some of the names that are in these cans up here, these four cans, or write some names to pray about them. By the way, if you know the answers to prayer, those let us know what those answers are. We want to rejoice in them. If somebody gets saved, if somebody gets right with God, let us know so that we can rejoice in those, if you would. Maybe you just need to come to pray today. Maybe you've got loved ones who are lost and don't know Jesus. Maybe you need to ask the Lord to make a divine appointment that they might, not, they might know him. I don't know what it is. God knows what's in your life. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. I'm going to pray. And I'm going to ask you to step forward and come and be obedient to the Holy Spirit. You don't have to be a member of this church to come down here. You, don't, you can be the first time visitor. You can be here all your life. God wants to see you coming before him and asking him to fix things in your life today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. Oh, Father, I pray that your word would hone in on our heartstrings. And, Father, we would be obedient to you and do whatever you've called and asked us to do. Father, help us to have faith in you and show it by our deeds that we do for you. Father, I pray today for anyone lost that they would come to know you today. Father, we thank you. We praise you for who you are. We look forward to what you're going to do in the hearts of your people right now. Father, I pray a hedge of protection around this place. Satan's already trying to rob the victory. Father, I pray that you would put that protection around us and we'd give that victory to you today. Help us, Lord, to be bold and faithful to stand up for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you step out and come right now as we sing?